You are listening to episode 107 of the Juice Box Podcast. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is... Ooh, my voice just... <clears throat> let's, I'm a little ill. I'll try again. Hold on. <clears throat> this episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by Dexcom and Omnipod. And we thank our sponsors. You can visit myomnipod.com forward slash juice box or dexcom.com forward slash juice box to find out more about the good people that sponsor the show. Today's guest is Lori. Lori is a D-mom and... Boy, Basil is really snoring today. Lori's a D-mom and she is also a... Hmm, let me call her here. Hold on a second. Let me just make some clicking. She's a board of trustee at Camp Najaya. Pretty cool, huh? Lori's going to talk about type 1, her life with it, her daughter's life with it, how they found Diabetes Camp, and uh, tell you a little bit about how you can go too. It's pretty great stuff. Here we go. Hey, if you're enjoying the Juice Box podcast, and I hope you are, please take time to tell a friend about it. I know you were sort of like recommended for the show so that you've probably never heard it before, uh, but there's nothing formal about it. So <laughs> um, you're going to introduce yourself any way you would like to be known. And then we'll chat for a while. I'll ask you some questions and we'll get to the heart of the matter and, and find out some stuff you probably didn't think you were going to talk about. And then before you know it, it'll be like you had a call with a friend on the phone and it'll be over. Okay, right. great. Yes. No, I actually... You are correct. I obviously am heavily involved in the T1D community, but I had never heard of the Juice Box podcast until Scott had told me about it. And then he connected us and I actually did listen to a few of your podcasts and they were interesting. It was neat. Oh, thank so. you. Oh, I'm glad you liked it. It's uh, well, actually you didn't say you liked it. I'm glad you listened. <laughs> no, I did. I did like it. It was informative. It was very, it, it's, it, it's real life. It's not like super formal. I noticed it's just, you know, yeah. cut and dry and or not cut and dry I should say it's just it is what it is and it's just nice for people to express themselves and not have to be so formal or you know just speak what's on their mind because this is a disease that's constantly on your mind so well I think if you know if you're if you're heavily involved with sort of the more I don't know what to call it um professional side of the advocacy, I guess, like that kind of feeling like, you know, if you're like ADA, JDRF, if you work at a camp or something like that, there's always this feeling of like propriety, like, right. Like you, like people want to, you know, when it's a company, they want to, they want to come across as, you know, professional and, mm-hmm. and that's always fine. But then once ha- what happens then is then you start lines get drawn. Right. So, you know, at the beginning of this episode somewhere, you know, I'll say that, you know, nothing you hear on this podcast should be considered advice or medical or otherwise and see a doctor. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah. that, and that way, if you and I start talking about how you handle a my le- daughter, uh, right, or, right, yeah. right. We, you and I are having a conversation and, yeah. and, and what I, my goal was is to just give, you know, give those conversations a place to be so that when people listen through them, so it's not as much, you can hear me, I'll do a little self uh, evaluation, right? So it might be easier to go onto a YouTube video and have somebody in six minutes tell you, do this when this happens, do that when this happens, et cetera, et cetera. Except that that's so specific and it's kind of gets down to what your doctor does. Your doctor says, Hey, if your blood sugar is low, you should treat eat, yourself, eat 15 grams of carbs, wait 15 minutes and test minutes yourself. Test, right. Yeah. Which but is that's not real life. Right. Or, I mean, it is, but it isn't. And it, there's so many other variables and factors. Exactly. And, and, and no one ever talks about mile, them. Did you just, uh, you know, did you just wake up and end up low? There's so many other factors. It's not just as cut and dry as that. Exactly. And then so there's, and so maybe my thought was maybe after you hear one, five, ten, twenty people talk through their experiences, you'll recognize, oh wow, that person does it. It's a, it's it's a variation of theme. It's sort of that, but then they they've modified mm-hmm. it this way or this has happened to them. And then, and I thought maybe that'll be valuable. And and it. it Somebody sent me an email over the weekend, and actually this person's going to be on the show coming up pretty soon. And she mm-hmm. said, you know, she's like, oh, I've been listening. I found the podcast, and I love it. And I've been listening through it. It's really helping me to think differently about my, you know, it's and she, all these things she was saying it was helping her do were, were nothing that I set out to accomplish. 
Mm-hmm. It's happening through her listening to the conversations. Mm-hmm. You know, and so then when people always say to me, look, I don't know what I would bring to this. And I would say, well, you just, you would bring your, your experience to it. it whatever, mm-hmm. whatever it is. It doesn't have to be. I think we're so used to thinking of things like, I don't know, like the news. Like you turn on the news and somebody sits in front of you and very formally says, hey, this is what just happened. And I'm going to explain it to you in five bullet points and then you're going to walk away understanding it better. And that's how information is supposed to transfer back and forth. Except I don't think that that's sort of not how my brain works. So I thought maybe other people's don't too, you know, so. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And when it comes to this kind of management, it isn't so cut and dry. No, absolutely. It's like life. It's like things can sway and move and you got to go with the flow and just keep moving forward. So. Such a, it's such a good way to think about it that it, it, the diabetes ebbs and flows and you sort of have to roll with it and kind of keep your spine loose and go with it a little bit because if Mm -hmm. you get, if you get rigid at some point, yeah. Start planting your flag and fighting a battle and fight a battle yeah. somewhere. You'll realize that it's it's meaningless what you're doing. You, you know, mm-hmm. you, you just have to kind of. And it's go. also a long road. <laughs> yeah, it's more difficult that way. That's for certain, right? Just to stand yeah. here and go, this should be like this. I'm gonna make this work, and you're like, yeah, yeah. you're not gonna make anything work. <laughs> <laughs> so just react to what's happening, or you know, and and how we kind of talk about it here a little bit. I think I just use the royal way because I am the only person talking uh, usually, but. Um, you know, I, I like the idea of just being a little more aggressive with diabetes. Like, don't wait for it to do something to you. You do something to it. You, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, and that idea of, like, if you affect it first, at least you know that the result of your actions were from your actions. And then you can mm-hmm. sort of, like, dissect that later and say, oh, wow, I yeah. did this and this happened. You know, uh, instead mm-hmm. of just going, I don't know what happened. Everything seemed okay. And then all of a sudden, mm-hmm. you know, boom. But Yeah, I mean, no, it's all about gathering the data analyzing, interpreting it and moving forward. Yep. So that's what I think. Well, Lori, yeah. we, are, we are now probably five minutes in. We should probably let okay. you introduce yourself at this point. Sorry. Yes. Gonna okay. use, because I'm going to use most of what we talked about just now. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead. Any way you want to be known, just blurt it out right now. Uh, I am uh, currently a stay at home mom who has a daughter diagnosed uh, three years ago next month. Actually, um, in about two weeks, it will be three years. And uh, I'm a big uh, advocacy with diabetes. Um, I believe uh, taking the disease kind of head on and having my daughter there with me so she can empower herself and have diabetes just be a chronic disease she has, not something that lives her life. Yeah, so you're just, you know, it's funny, we talked about I talked about this the other day with somebody, Lori, and Lori's good. We, we can just call you Lori. Does that work? Yes, yeah, that's yeah. Nice. And so um, Arden happened to be at a doctor's office, a dentist's office, and it's not a, it's not a person we see very frequently. Um, she's, of all the funny things, she, has, she doesn't like to get a needle at the dentist. So mm-hmm. she, she has to go to – so our dentist, local dentist that we use for everything, he doesn't use laughing gas. So if Arden needs to get like a cavity filled, she has to go somewhere and where someone will gas her and turn her into a bowl of jelly. And then she's just, yeah, like, yeah. And then, then she's like, go ahead, stick the needle. I don't care. And, and, <laughs> and, you know, so we go see this person who we, you know, like I said, we don't see very frequently. I maybe hadn't seen him in, in three or four years. Um, and we, you know, he understands Arden has diabetes. He lets me sit in the room. Uh, off in the corner, I monitor her blood sugar through a Dexcom. I give her insulin when she needs it or cut it back if I have to. Anything to keep her in a good kind of stable place during the procedure. Mm-hmm. Um, and he asked a lot of questions along the way about diabetes. And we, uh, you know, we had a nice conversation back and forth. And then at some point he asked me if I knew a person. He's like, you know, he just said a name. Do you know this person? And it would be easy for me to say that I'm pretending not to know, but I don't remember. I wouldn't tell you anyway the name, but I don't remember mm-hmm. anyway. And I thought real hard and I said, no, you know, I've never heard that name before. He said, oh, it's, it's a patient of mine that comes in, has type 1 diabetes, is a real advocate for it, but talks about it in a way that's off-putting. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, what do you mean by that? And he said, he's so put upon. And I was like, oh, cool. Where are we going with this? Like, like this is going to be a real honest conversation, right? Like, like yeah. you know, Arden's gassed. He's talking, fi- fixing her tooth. And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, it just seems like that he's made a decision or that the, the or that the, the disease has been so rough for him that he's not himself anymore. He's this person living afflicted. And, oh. and when he talks about diabetes, he said it's so militant and off-putting and 
that anything that he does advocacy wise, by the time he walks out, you don't leave with a good feeling. You don't, he doesn't leave and you go, Oh, you know what? I bet I would donate some money to this. Mm -hmm. You leave and think, I think I'm glad he's gone. I don't want him to come back. Yes. Or you become fearful of the disease. I feel sometimes if you talk certain ways to certain people, even if you're not trying to be off putting, it's kind of like you have to uh, know the audience and who you're talking with. I find when I talk about diabetes, it just really struck me for the first time that I thought like, wow, there's, I wonder what the sum total of like progress is. Like, you know, if there's, if there's, I don't know, just a random number that obviously won't be big enough, but if there's a million people out in the world, you know, advocating for something and a half a million of them are doing a good job of it and a half a million of them are doing a poor job of it, is the line moving at all? Or are we just sitting perfectly still in the sum yeah. total? Like, you, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and the, the most in, like kind of like impressive part of the conversation, as the doctor said, the person doesn't, he's not a bad guy. He's not, mm -hmm. he's just not the right person to be a mouthpiece for something. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, that's completely interesting. Y you know? Yeah. And, and then I was like, I, I never really would have thought of that. And I said, am I doing that to you? And he goes, no. He goes, yes. He said, when I look at you, I, I listen to our conversation. I'm left with the idea that your daughter is a person who happens to have type one diabetes. And when I look at him, I don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, great. I said, look, you know, because that is sort of the goal. You know? Yeah, well, that's a compliment to you as well. And kudos to you for I told uh, that whole story, having that Lori. perspective in life. Yeah. I told that whole story just so I could be complimented, actually, just now. Oh. I'm, j I'm, just, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm joking. I just thought it was a really interesting... I just never considered that there was somebody out there who was wholeheartedly and 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 with all their just with their their desire to do good was thumping a drum and didn't realize that every time they walked away from somebody that person was put off by them. I thought that was yeah. really something, you know. So, anyway, um point is, I think you need to I think you need to obviously people can do whatever they want to do, but for us you know, you have diabetes, you need to keep moving. There's ways to manage, you know, there's ways to do things. There's understandably going to be days that, you know, aren't as, uh, rough. Yeah, 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 yeah. They aren't as easy as others. And you just sort of have to kind of roll with the waves and keep going, I think. So mm -hmm. anyway, um, so, so three years ago in April, and your, mm -hmm. was it your daughter? I'm sorry, was diagnosed? Yes. It's my daughter, Emily. How old she is she? She was diagnosed as you, uh, she was seven and a half, um, April 8th. 2014. I'm sure you, that's your diversity. I believe that's what they call it. And I'm sure you with your daughter know that date and that moment and all that stuff that happened that day. Laura, you're delightful. I don't really know. Uh, it was in August sometime oh, Okay. <laughs> in 2000. And I'm going to say sex, uh, it just, okay. I, but again, my brain doesn't work that way. So okay. you listen to this podcast enough. You'll hear somebody come on and say, I was diagnosed in 2008. And I start going, 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. That, was that like eight years ago? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I just don't, I, I, I'm, I, and you're, you're, you know what I'm, as you said that, I bet you that three years into my daughter's diagnosis, I did know the day right off the top of my head. Uh -huh. But a, dec well, you know, a decade ago, I, I don't. I don't think I'll ever forget the day, but the year definitely as time progresses, you kind of, it's just part of your life. So it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. Like I think the, I know for myself when she was diagnosed, it was a big shock. I, well, especially for me, I definitely um, had a, I, wanna, I was very emotional and ups, upset and, and like scared and worried and concerned. But, you know, after about, I'd say six weeks and I was like, Oh, this, this is okay. And we're going to be okay. Um, but I think everybody handles it differently, maybe at first with the diagnosis. So, yeah. And I do think that your experience um, leads to how you kind of feel about it. Like, Rick, if things go pretty smoothly in the beginning, you know, it's funny, 10 years ago before, like, you know, a glucose monitor, and we were just testing with this little meter, uh -huh. you know, I just thought, hey, we're doing fine. You, you know, like, this is going, I didn't have any of the data. I didn't really know it. We were probably, you know, her A1C was nine something. We weren't really doing uh -huh. fine. We weren't really doing fine. But, uh -huh. Based on the tiny bit of information we were given, which is, you know. Those snapshots of time. Yeah, or instant, yeah. yeah. If you were alive, you felt like you were winning. Like like that yeah. kind of thing, right? And so, and, and now I look back and I realize had I, had I been able to see the data at that point, I would have known we weren't doing well. And maybe that would have moved my timeline faster to try to do more quicker or try to understand better or whatever. Just because it took me. I'd say, I always say it took me about two years to not feel completely out of my mind about it. Uh -huh. And then it probably took me another three years on top of that 
to get to the point where I could have told you, like, I'm doing a good job managing this, mm-hmm. you, you know, and so, and then it's been the last five years of sort of, you know, kind of thoughtfully looking back over the things that we've learned and making these, mm-hmm. these adjustments that have gotten yeah. us to where we are. So, yeah, well, and actually, um, I know I'm jumping a bit ahead, but the one thing I'd like to talk a lot about is, uh, camp, diabetes camp. And my daughter does go to Camp Najeda specifically, but uh, that was actually a very positive turning point for me. Uh, my daughter was diagnosed in April. Um, as I said, the first few weeks were very emotionally hard for me. Mm-hmm. And then I came to a good point. And then, of course, my daughter got a stomach bug and we had to go to the hospital to get fluids because she was not well. And that was kind of like a little setback. And then, you know, we continued on with the summer and we had already had plans to go to a day camp before she was diagnosed. And I talked to them and she did go there. and It was actually pretty smooth. But um, while she was at day camp one day, I visited Camp Najetta because I'd heard about it through our um, endocrinologist. And I had called the executive director and I said, oh, you know, my daughter was diagnosed just a a few months ago. I'm I'm very interested in your camp. Can I can I come drive up and, and take a peek and see what it's like? And when I went in there, you know, here I am kind of this newbie T1D mom walking around and it was the, uh, the last session. So there were the older kids were there mm-hmm. and, uh, I, I said, Oh, so where do they sleep? You know, sleep away camp. And he showed me the cabins and we happened to knock on one of the girl cabins door. And it just so happened. One of the counselors were in there. She actually just like had come from the shower. She was getting dressed anyway. Uh, she was appropriately dressed. So, you know, we walked in and, uh, I talked to her for about 25 minutes and That conversation just totally made me realize, wow, my daughter really can do anything in the world. She's going to be able to do anything. This, you know, this type one she has, it's, it's just something she just has to deal with. And, but it's nothing, it's not ever going to hold her back. I mean, this girl was in college. She had just studied abroad in England. She herself was a T1D and just talking to her and meeting her and seeing her approach and her life. And I was like, wow. And it just, it was such a big turning point for me. Just, and it was just a random event that happened. It wasn't like I had scheduled this meeting with her. She happened, it was Kismet. She yeah. happened to be there. I was there and just talking to her and the executive director was kind of like, all right, I got to go. Do you want to talk to her? You can get her number. <laughs> but you know, cause it wasn't, we weren't supposed to talk like that. It just randomly yeah. Happened. Yeah, it happened. I asked her a quick thing and one thing led to another and she just talked about herself and her life. And, and <laughs> the, that's, I'm just imagining that, the director going, this woman said she just wanted to see things. And now I'm standing here for half an hour while she's talking to this poor girl. And that's like half dressed. <laughs> yeah. I liked it in the beginning of the story. You were like, she was appropriate or just, and I wanted to, I knew you were about to say something important, so I didn't cut you off, but I wanted to say, Lori, I didn't think you were about to launch into a story about how you saw a teenage girl undressed at camp. Like, I didn't think that was the story you were going to tell, um, no. but, but you were just so cute. You were like, no, I just wanted to let you know that she was dressed appropriately. <laughs> um, so was she the first person that you met in the real world, like an adult that had type one diabetes? Yeah. She was, and she was a counselor. Now, I was aware when I talked to the executive director that most people that worked there were type ones, but just seeing it, you know, one thing you hear things, but to actually see it in action or to see her there and have her talk about things. And I think actually the conversation arose because I, I guess we all have our hiccups. So I was just the glucagon kit. I don't know if you recall when your daughter got diagnosed and they talked about the glucagon kit and, yeah, you know, how, I didn't listen to oh, that. okay. But go, yeah, because yeah. they were like, you'll never need this. And I was like, cool, don't have to remember that. And then, yeah, I, and by the mind, way, then a few months later, she had a seizure. And I thought, I really wish I would have paid attention. No one had it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in my mind, that was my hiccup where, you know, I, 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 what happens if you go into that? Or, or some, I don't even know. Like in my mind, it was just something that kind of always irked me or just it, it was a hiccup in my mind. So literally, I think that was the second question I had asked her was, oh, I was like, oh, by the way, that glucagon kit, have you ever used it? She's like, Oh yeah, about five times. <laughs> <laughs> then you were she just was like, so nonchalant. She's like, yeah, the first time my parents took me to the hospital. By the third or fourth time, you know, they didn't even take me to the hospital. They knew what to do. <laughs> yeah, uh, we Arden's had two seizures. They were both when she was much younger, and we didn't okay. we didn't have monitoring and stuff like that. But at the same uh-huh. but at the same time, the first one, you know, we we got her out of it with gel. And okay. not we probably would have used the glucagon had uh-huh. had I 
paid attention in the doctor's office, but I was fumbling with it for so long. My wife's like, let me just try to put this gel on her cheek and see what happens. Um, yeah. But I, I share the story all the time because as frightening as it was, and it was one of the things in my life that it will stick with me forever as being just one of the most terrible things I've seen happen. Yeah. Um, she was really okay afterwards. And it, hap- yeah. it happened again a number of months later. And the story is so funny that I wrote about it on my blog. Uh-huh. And it's, it's, if you can get past the fact that it's a story about a little kid having a seizure, it's hilarious. And, uh-huh. it, you, you know, and then it, when it was over, uh, we had somebody with us that, you know, was an extended family member. Like, are we going to go, you know, should we go to the hospital? I'm like, no, she's fine. We're going to put her back to bed. It's all good. Yeah. You, you, you know, yes. so. And that's that comfort level where you know it's going to be okay. Yeah. Because, you know, basically when you get diagnosed, or at least this was my feeling, and, and they did, they did well. I'm not blaming anybody, but it's just, they give you all of this information. You're kind of, I, and me personally, I guess I was still in shock because yeah, it was kind of out of the blue. No one in our family had type one, which you hear a lot of the time. And you're just, you know, you go to the doctor. I said, something doesn't seem right. And, and I had brought it up. I said, could she be diabetic? And they're like, no, she's not diabetic. Even the doctor questioned me. I said, well, can we do a urine test just to make sure? Yeah. And my daughter didn't have to go. And the doctor's like, well, just bring it in a week or two. And I'm like, no, no, I want to do this now. Right. Yeah. What and, if we just sit here until she pees? How would that be? Yeah. yeah. I was like, we're going to wait until she has to go because I can't, I, this is going to drive me nuts. Good for you. So going from that, then the doctor, all of a sudden, I hand in the urine. She does the test or whatever. She comes in with this look on her face, says, let's check her blood sugar now. You, you don't even get a reading on the blood sugar monitor, you know, the, the monitor or the meter. And uh, then they're like, okay, we're calling, you know, the hospital. You're going to be admitted immediately. Do not go home. Call your husband right now. Tell him you're going to the hospital. You can meet him there. You know, just yeah. you talk about a change of day <laughs> from, you know, going was, to the doctor. <laughs> I was going to stop at the mall on the way home. Is that, that's off now too? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need some things, but I guess we could get them on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, so, yeah. No, it's funny how it. It's interesting too. So she was, how uh, was she sick to the point where, I mean, what was her? Do you remember what her blood sugar was when somebody was finally able to quantify it and tell you what it was? No, they actually never told me how high it was. But um, I know it read high on the meter. Although, what is that above five hundred or six hundred? I don't even. Some, I don't know. Some meters are. I think five hundred is pretty much the the average. But some it's meters okay. are a little different. But yeah. Um, but I have a hunch. Once again, I don't know when your daughter was diagnosed. Because how old was she? I, I don't recall. She was two. Uh, in okay, so she was younger. Yeah. But I do recall, you know, my daughter turned seven, and uh, that was in September. And I don't think it necessarily happened right then, but my guess is, like, looking back, even at photos, like, looking at her face and how her, just her, um, her skin and, like, complexion and just certain things, you know, she's blonde and blue-eyed, so that was my excuse in January. I was like... We got these professional photos done, and I hate to say it, she looked horrible. And I was just like, oh, it must be, you know, it's wintertime, and the, the sun, she's not getting any sun, and she just looks really bad, and she looked really lean and thin, but oh, you know, maybe she's just growing, and her body's not caught up with her weight. You know, not, you, you rationalize, because you, really you don't do. necessarily know what's going on. Yeah, yeah. You start going, oh, wow, my daughter's going to be an alabaster skin model one day. This is fantastic. Yeah, yeah like yeah. you don't necessarily realize what it is, right, or at right, that right, time, yeah. you don't think anything of it. And then um, the weekend before she was diagnosed, it was my son's birthday party. And um, I just remember she had, she went to the bathroom like four times in two hours. So it was like every half hour. And then it kind of dawned on me. I'm like, you know, she's going to the bathroom a lot. And also her attitude in the last like two months or so, she was very dramatic, like Mm. more dramatic than normal. (laughs) And I actually took her originally made the appointment for the doctor because I needed a recommended for a psychologist. That's what I was going for originally. Yeah. And then literally that night before I took her, I woke up in the middle of the night and I said, I wonder if she could be diabetic. And I looked it up online. Why did that hit you like that? Do you know? You know, you heard me tell that story a little bit ago about Arden at the dentist office. That dentist appointment was, you know, pretty long. And we were able to, with the help of Dexcom and Omnipod, keep her blood sugar right at like 110 the entire time. And she was uh, pretty whacked out on the laughing gas. So we were definitely in a spot where I didn't want to have to ask her to drink juice or anything like that. Um, The technology definitely made a big uh, impact on that. So let's talk about it for a minute. You know, because whether it's 
this dentist appointment or this past weekend as Arden played six softball games in basically a day and a half and her blood sugar was really rather easy to take care of. It's important to know that these things can't happen without this technology and, and I'm genuinely thrilled that these uh, two companies are sponsoring the podcast. The Dexcom G5 mobile continuous glucose monitoring system is the first FDA approved device to let you make treatment decisions without pricking your finger. Just think about what that means. Sure, it means less finger sticks, but that's really just the minimum of it. To begin managing your type 1 diabetes with the same great technology that has helped us to keep Arden's A1C between 5.8, oh, no wait, we just went to the end out. To keep, to, ooh, mm, I'll start over. To begin managing your type 1 diabetes with the same great technology that has helped us to keep Arden's A1C between 5.7 and 6.2 for over three and a half years, please visit dexcom.com forward slash juice box or click on the link in your show notes. They're going to ask me to read a disclaimer here. You ready? Finger sticks are still required for calibration or if your symptoms or expectations do not match readings or when taking medications containing acetaminophen. Seriously, I don't know how I would keep Arden's A1C and her blood sugar where I do without the Dexcom. Check it out. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. And now let's talk about the Omnipod. And let's keep talking about this weekend. So Arden played three softball games on Saturday, 1230... I think three o'clock and five o'clock. Then she went back to a hotel with her team. She had dinner, went swimming, got a shower, messed around the hotel all night, running around the halls with her friends, got right back up in the morning again, played again at 10 o'clock, two o'clock and four o'clock. And they sadly lost in the championship game. But I watched Arden, like I said, swim, shower, run around, diving all over the place at third base i she dove for a ball and came crashing down right on where her pod was and everything fine no problems that thing stuck on like glue and how about this every time her blood sugar tried to go up a little bit maybe because of adrenaline from the game or because food i mean we had lunch at a diner where she ate all kinds of crazy stuff i was able to just bump it a little bit a little bit of insulin here a little bit of insulin there that way we're not you know It's not too much. You're not injecting at this dirty ball field. And her blood sugar was fantastic, literally fantastic all day. Now, at the end of that long day, and after all that activity, no lie, you know, around 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, her blood sugar gets a little low, and it's a little difficult to deal with. But because she's using the Omnipod, I was able to give her carbs and cut off her basal rate for a little while to help it come right back up so we could both sleep calmly and safely through the night. I'm telling you right now, you should check into the Omnipod. Go to myomnipod.com forward slash juice box to get your free, no obligation demo today. You will not be disappointed, I promise. You know, we have type two in our family, but as I said, no type one. And as you know, there's no correlation with type two, type one in, you know, family you genetics. Know, there's nothing, nothing that stands out to you that you knew from your past or you witnessed at some point that. Yeah. You- I mean, you know what? It sounds silly. I remember seeing that movie, uh, nothing in common with Tom Hanks and, uh, what was the honeymooner guy? And he was a type two, but I just remember the foot amputation. I don't know, just, that's, it sounds silly, but that's always what I always thought about type two diabetes. Like, oh, you have to be careful because. You know, obviously, bad things can happen if you don't take care of yourself. Well, yeah, type two diabetes is like a Tom Hanks movie. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. But it, so <laughs> anyway, um, I, I, I don't. It just something in my head. I don't know. Maybe it was the the going to the bathroom like twice in the half hour or that weekend. The over the drama at my son's birthday party. The way she was acting. It kind of just. All of a I don't know. I guess it. I was just thinking about it, and all of a sudden, it came together in my head. But the ironic thing is when I went to the doctor, the doctor thought I was kind of like, oh, she doesn't have diabetes. Don't worry about it. And I was like, no, but I think she might. <laughs> Can we just test her? You know that, that part of the, the weird faces when they walked back in the room, by the way, were that when they got out in the hallway after you said that, they were like, oh, this woman. <laughs> and they, probably not. Right, yeah. right, right. And then they're like, oh, just let the kid pee in a cup so we can get her out of here. And then they had to come back in and with their, head, their tail between their legs. And you yeah, know, you know. yeah. Right. No, so, yeah, you know that happened. Um, but, also, but good for you, though, to, for sticking up for yourself and for, you know, for not giving up. Yes, but also kind of in the doctor's defense, they're not living with the child. So sometimes parents can have, you know, illusions or, you know what I mean. Of so course. I don't really blame the doctor, but it definitely, she wasn't worried. Let's put it that way. She's like, oh, no, because she actually, 
my daughter was eating and I mean, eating, 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 yeah. but it didn't dawn on me. She didn't gain any weight. She didn't lose any weight, but she must have been eating. I don't know how much food a day. And it didn't even dawn on me that she was eating that much and not gaining weight. Brianna Arden was like eating like a horse and losing weight at the same time. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, she managed to maintain her weight, ironically, from the September to that March, like that April when we had taken her. By the way, you just defended the doctor with the same tone that you were like, that girl was not naked. I just wanted to let you know that. You were like, hey, listen, <laughs> he's a good guy. And he... <laughs> yeah, well, no, she's a, she's a very good doctor. Okay. And I, you know, I like to give her credit when due. But uh, once again, I don't, you know, yes. Um, I just like your personality. I just like your personality. You're just like, I just want to make sure everyone knows that this is a good person and that <laughs> no one was naked. Uh, and so, <laughs> okay, so Lori. Um, so you're, you're three years into it and you, you know, you were looking for something and you found camp. And the reason that you're on the show today, uh, if it wasn't so specific why you were on, I would have to title this episode type two diabetes is like a Tom Hanks movie. But, um, but since you're on for something very specific, can you tell people like, you know, after your daughter went to the camp, you guys found it a little more than good, right? You found it great and you're more involved with the camp now. Um, yeah. You're now so the person had, who takes the, the families around and watches them bug the counselors. Yeah. No, is that <laughs> <Yes>. right? <laughs> so I had gone to the camp in the summer of 14 to my day visit where I met the, um, the appropriately dressed counselor. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, from that point, um, it was already kind of, camp had kind of ended for that season. Right. So then uh, we did go to family camp. So what I had done is I, we went to family camp, but the week after that, or the weekend after that weekend, I should say, started session one of Camp Pajetta. So I had registered her for session one, but I said, let's go to family camp the weekend before, because as mommies worry about their children and letting go and sleep away, I was like, is she really going to be okay to be away from me for a week? Is she going to be okay in this environment? Because she's done day camp, but never sleep away camp. Yeah, and she's also young. She was eight and a half. So, uh, we did family camp. Uh, it was, you know, obviously towards the end of June. And uh, she literally, by the second day, she's like, Mommy, aren't you leaving? And I'm like, no, no, no. That's next week, Mommy leaves. <laughs> <laughs> Go away, lady. <laughs> she made, yeah, so I was like, all right, I know she's good. I don't have to worry about her. <laughs> Getting homesick? No, she's fine. Yeah, it's a little heartbreaking, by the way, that it only took two days for your eight-year-old Yeah, I know. Like, she was literally like, Mom, aren't you leaving? <laughs> I didn't like, realize no. how, su how suffocating you are, but I need you to go now. And so... <laughs> Yes. And even when I dropped her off, it was like, uh, not that she didn't hug me goodbye and say, I love you, but it was definitely like, okay, mom, you can leave now. Yeah. Yeah. She was definitely on her way to, to, to being excited about it. And so what do you think is, I mean, you know, she's not here, but what do you think is her favorite part of going to, and by the way, say the name of the camp again for people. Oh, Camp Najetta. Okay. And does that word mean something? Because for a decade, I've wondered if it meant something. Yeah. It means New Jersey Wait, don't. I, I'm trying to be diplomatic. It's something New Jersey Diabetes Association, possibly, or so, it's something to do with New Jersey and diabetes. Okay, because the J is always like throwing me off. But uh, now I understand. Yeah, it's some more people say I say Na, do I say Najeda or Najita? I don't even know what I say anymore because I'm not even sure exactly. Is it Najeda, Najita, potato, potato. I'm something not really she sure. Something you shouldn't stop and think about. Yes. So. Um, but but okay. So what what do you think about the camp that that kind of captured her attention and, and made it something she wanted to do. And, and what the do you think she's thing, gotten out of it? Um, or I think she's gotten, I'd say two really great, amazing things out of the camp. First off, the friendships that she's made there. Yes. When she was diagnosed, there were a few other type ones, but nobody in exactly her grade that she exactly knew that she had any kind of relationship or rapport with. So, you know, you get into this camp, you're in a, in a, you know, a, a, a cabin with, kids around your age and you know yes they're some are, most are from jersey other places as well but you're you have this immediate something in common and uh you know you then you start to get to know each other you you forge friendships and i it's nice to have somebody that kind of sometimes understands things even as me as the mom sometimes i don't necessarily get what she's feeling or get her frustration or you know when i say no you can't have four chocolate bars <laughs> But, you know, if you have a friend that understands that, I think that's, that, that's a great ally to have for her okay. and to kind of work through some of the challenges that she may face that right. I can't understand. Right. Yeah, so so just, that's the one. So just okay. in the same way as that having the counselor explain to you gave you this real life connection with diabetes and it made you feel like, wow, this is real and it's okay. 
mm-hmm. you think she's got that same idea. She's met another yes. person who echoes her feelings kind of back to her and, yes. and, and lets her feel like, oh, okay. So, so you think the best, maybe the most important part of it thus far for her has been just finding people who are living in the same situation as her. Yes. And having those friendships and that connection. And also she adores and loves the counselors. And I, I'm actually kind of glad, I'm happy about that because I, I think those people can kind of teach her to, you know, empowerment, embrace who she is and, and look at all they accomplish and what amazing, great people they are. And, you know, it's like, look, even though I, you know, I have this chronic disease, I'm able to do all of these things. And I, I do go away to college and I do study abroad and I've, I've traveled alone without my parents and I've, I've done all these things and it kind of is a good role model or, uh, you know, a, a, a peer person to look up to and be like, wow, yeah. look, look at all the things they do. And so what if, you know, diabetes is just something they have. It's not who makes them who they are. Right. And, and a role model almost in the sense of they're, they're a window to the future. And yeah. You, yeah. Right. You can see, you can see where things can be headed for you and, mm-hmm. uh, and takes away a lot of the fear that, that is understandable, you know, and, yeah. and comes. Yeah. That's, it kind of takes, yeah, sheds the fear away and makes them realize that, yeah. And then, you know, there are, everybody has, you know, tricky days, we call them. Emily, we're, it's tricky right now. It's a little tricky. So we're trying to figure it out. But that doesn't, I try not to make it into this dark, sad fear thing when things are challenging. It's tricky. We say, oh, it can be tricky and we'll figure it out. Yeah. And instead of that approach, just so she's aware of that. So yes, it does have its challenges, but we're going to get through it and we're going to get through it, be better about it, or just know you know, how to handle it in the future. Right. Now, I mean, especially in the beginning, it's the unknown is crazy in the beginning, Mm -hmm. you you know, like with anything, you have a baby, buy a house, you you know, there's unknown, but it, it, those things sort of never make you feel, think about like the finite um, Uh nature of life. You you know what I mean? Like, you don't buy, although I have to say when I signed a mortgage the first time, I was like 30 years and it just overwhelmed me. I'm like, I'm not going to live 30 years. This is ridiculous. Like, you, you know, like, and, and even when I was younger, I remember my first car loan thinking the same thing. Like, four years. Yeah, that's <laughs> a long time. What am I going to, I don't understand. I want to have this thing for four years. And it changes your perspective. But it, there's so many different, you know, there's something about, obviously, the future and the unknown that is that can be off-putting, but at the same time, when it's your first time with something and that's mixed in with it, it's it's terrible. And then you make it a health mm-hmm. issue, and it's bigger. And uh, yeah, you know, and you worry. It's like course. life or death in a way. Well, yeah, in a definite way. You, you know, like yeah. it's it's funny because you know sometimes we talk around it a little bit, but people and listen, I you know you and I don't know each other, but we definitely don't live with the idea that you know my daughter's fragile and is is you know always a second away from dropping over. Um, no, definitely not. Right, right. Maybe when she was first diagnosed I, or diagnosed, I might have felt that way for a day or two. Like I was, I was literally, I would wake up, you know, 2 a.m. I remember in the hospital just looking at her. I'm like, is she still alive? Right. Is she going to be okay? Yeah, right, right. Well, no, exactly. And, and by the way, that statement's not to uh, in any way belittle the fact that some people do just, you know, but, you know it's sad. Pa- pass I, away I at times sad. that are completely untimed, you, you know, and, yeah. and that's, but I've always, I've talked about it on here all the time. It's just. In the end, it is not much different than the idea of someone will get in their car today, drive away from their home, and get killed in a car accident. And yet, we all will get in our cars tomorrow and never and really think about life. it. Right. Yeah. And, and you yeah. sort of have to have that attitude with diabetes. With this, I think, yes, I yeah. agree. Otherwise, it will eat you alive and it will drive you nuts. Because I do see, you know, there are, you know, people obviously that have our kind of attitudes, but there are other people that don't think about it like that and think about it more as, uh, you know, if I don't do this, 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 I'm going to die today, or my daughter's going to do this, or they, they become such hypochondriacs and it almost drives them to a maddening. Yeah. Where it, it, you can't, it's kind of sad. I feel bad, but you can't change. Like you, you can try to help them. the nature of that person. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And that is sort of, you know, Lori, this conversation for a second, because I've always wanted to talk about this here and I never have. And it's kind of ill fitting in this conversation, but, um, but, but, you know, like the, um, I think the idea is that, you you can there are pe- like it, people's minds all work differently like that that is 100% you know without a doubt true um but at what point do you have to 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 kind of 
I don't, I don't know what the word is, but segregate, you know, like you can't, in, you, when you're in the community, it's hard to talk about all of the aspects of how everyone might be thinking about diabetes, right? You can't, mm-hmm. if, you know, every sentence would be seven paragraphs long if we did that, you know, you, mm-hmm. you, you, you've seen it here. We've parsed our, we've had to parse ourselves. Well, if this is you, then of course that would be different. And if you, if you feel this, mm-hmm. way, but at some point someone just has to come out and say, look, you can live like this in a positive way and it will work out for you most of the time. This is should be your goal. Now, if you are one of the people who very sadly it doesn't work that way for, then we need to find you support for that too. But the message coming from the top down can't be doom and gloom. You, you know what I mean? We can't start by telling everybody it's scary. You need to tell everybody, look, here's you know what, what that counselor did for you. Here's how well it's going for me. I think it could go this well for you too. Mm-hmm. You if you to, just change up your mind, yeah, your mindset, and a, look at it in a different angle. It's mostly about how you how, how you take it in, you, you know, and, mm-hmm. and 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 how you how you feel like, okay, great, I get this, and and I think I can do this, and let's try. Like I think in the end, it's just let's try, and then most people, it'll work out for, and some it won't. But that's the nature of talking about a, a mass of of people. Do you, mm-hmm. you, you know what I mean? Like I almost feel you're like not going to get everybody. Sadly, it's, it's almost like talking about um, about talking about the Affordable Care Act right now. Like I, I I recognize, and this won't be political, but I recognize it's not a perfect system at all. But millions yeah. more people have health care than did before. Also, some people are now being charged way too much money than they have been before. At uh, some yeah. point, as as a good as a good um, you know, government has to say, look, it's benefiting more people than it's hurting. And and that's got to be the, the 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 sort of the, the overreaching idea. That sucks when it gets to you and you're not one of the people it's benefiting. Mm-hmm. But but you don't have a you don't have a, a large conversation based on one person's needs. And mm-hmm. and so I love the idea of being positive and out in front of diabetes and saying, hey, I think this can work out for you. And and in, if it doesn't, then we have to find a way to to support you too. But I think the the first message has to be is that it you know the possibility exists and you should mm-hmm. go, and you should go for it, you know? Yes. Agreed. So, um, and so the camp is doing that for you. So did you get involved more? Um, are you, uh, Oh yeah. Involved, so after involved my camp? daughter went for the week, she'd had a great time. I even got a letter, I think, or two about how happy she was. And she did this and she did that. No tears, no homesickness, which was good. Although it kind of broke my heart a little. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you cry a little bit? That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I missed her more than she missed me, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, when I picked her up, she was like, oh, it's over. <laughs> you, <laughs> <Yes>. huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you have to come back home to us. going to go back but, to that um, house, are we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I picked her up, and, uh, you know, there's a... On um, departure day, there's always uh, other, you know, hands on deck there. There's the executive director was there. There were, there might have even been a few board members there that day. And I just started talking to them. And uh, I don't know, one thing led to another. And I said, you know, I'm kind of interested in, um, you know, getting more involved. I had actually that summer, well, that June had just done my first tour to cure. And um, I was starting to get the, the positive spin. You know, on, you know, look, my daughter has this yes. It, it's tricky at times, but we get through it and we're embracing it and we are who we are and moving forward. But I'd like to kind of give back more to a little, to the community with, you know, type one diabetes yeah. and kind of get involved more charity wise with this. So uh, one thing led to another and a few conversations in the fall, I ended up uh, getting onto the board. So I've been on the board. Let's see, I guess it's like two, is it two years or a year and a half? I don't, I don't even remember. Let's see. I think it's a year and a half you're about. Gonna so. count, you're going to be counting months in a minute like I do, and then you're going to look silly. So just trust me. Just skip over it and go. It's been about two years. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, well, and so you got you actually got on the board of the camp. Yeah. That's cool. And what do you do as a board member? Uh, well, we look at things, uh, you know, from the top level. Look at potential programs. Look at the uh, the the uh, general uh, the the facilities maintenance. The whole you know gamut of the camp. Keep it running. We also. Um, you know, look at uh, possible uh, fundraising efforts. Uh, you know, that's obviously when you have a nonprofit organization. Of you, know, you have you have to obviously be able to afford to go on and you know have fundraising, have people donate charities. Uh, so um, you kind of have your finger you know, in the whole thing, I guess. I, I don't honestly. know. 
Oh, go ahead. No, it's just you're involved in, in all the sort of the larger aspects of, of the camp yeah. and, it's, and its management. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's cool. And the one thing also I'd like to point out is the camp, obviously, uh, you know, some people, for, well, first of all, let's talk about the camp and like the pricing, let's say. But it's actually, most people I think are scared. They're like, oh, it's a medical camp and it's, you know, this and it's that and it's sleep away. It's actually very, I think, reasonably priced for a sleepaway camp. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if, you know, you might not be able to afford it, let's say, even being reasonably priced, they do offer camperships, I think, to about a third of the uh, people that attend. So, you know, they are, you know, trying to make it available to people that really need to go to the camp. So, so there's part of the donations that the camp takes in help to fund campers. Com yeah, com they're camperships, they okay. call them. Camperships. So, gotcha. And that's also why fundraising is so important. It's not just to maintain the general maintenance, because actually what they even charge for the camp is about half of what it really costs to run the camp per week for the child. Oh, by the way, I just got camperships as like scholarships, by the way. Um, oh. so, <laughs> just, just, I'm sorry. Okay. It just struck me. I was like, oh, like scholarships. That's amazing. Yeah, it's kind of like a scholarship to yeah. go there. Okay. So. so, okay. So, so listen, if I come in and I'm paying cash, what's it cost for a week? Uh, for a week, it's about $1,000. And then for two weeks, it's about two thousand. Sounds like but your remember, daughter, your daughter would pay that money, by the way, to get away from you. I think I'm from. I think she would, yeah. <laughs> so, but once again, that's the subsidized cost. I think it costs approximately eighteen hundred dollars a week for each camper to really come. Unsubsidized. So it's automatically right, right. subsidized to begin with, and then if you can't even, you know, if the thousand is hard for you to pay, uh, you can actually apply for a campership. And as I said, about a third of the campers do go on campership. Wow. That seems really cool. What is so a campership takes me down to no cost? Correct. Huh. I might go. Yeah. I could use to get away from people for a week. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um no, that's amazing. And and it's in New Jersey, but do people come from all over the country? Um or is it pretty localized? I think it's more like tri state area. Okay. There's definitely a lot of Jersey, PA, New York. Um you know, I think it's also word of mouth. Because the other thing too, Camp Nagetta, I think, is only one of five. Uh, really dedicated type one camps. I mean, that camp runs all summer for diabetes. Sometimes I think there's these pop-up camps that uh, maybe the ADA may run and it's like for a week, but it's a Pacific week. And I guess they lease that land or they have some kind of arrangement with that camp to use that space for the diabetic. Oh, I see. So, but Najetta goes on and on. For, so whenever yes, the weather's go good, it's there every week. Yes, they have five set. Well, Current, like this coming season, they have five sessions. Um, session one and session five are one week, and then two, three, and four are two weeks each. Okay. So that's a total of eight weeks of sleepaway camp they provide. Wow. Jeez, that's a, a hefty bill. How many kids yeah. are at the camp in a, in a week? Uh, it ranges, I, I, I want to say approximately 80 plus or minus 20. Oh, but that's great. That's still, that's to cover like my a, bases there. Yeah, yeah. But that's not like an overwhelming amount. It's not like you're going to, you know, some, you know, giant school with, you know what I mean? Going away to college with 80,000 people on campus. It's a, it's oh, a, no, no, no. It's a it's liberal arts experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. And also the, the ratio, the, the ratio you're getting is, uh, there's two, uh, head counselors and then two, uh, they're not called assistant counselors, but two other counselors, uh, junior counselors. Mm -hmm. So there's four counselors and there's, you know, eight to 10 per cabin. So it's a, it's an excellent ratio as well. So if there is a situation that arises and one counselor does have to take care of a child or take them somewhere, you still have other counselors with the kids. So you, and you know, it's, so it's a, as I said, it's a great ratio. You get a lot of, uh, a lot of good time with the counselors as well as the, the campers. How do they handle the management? Like so I've heard some camps are no technology camps and you go in and you just use injections and you and you test. no you're allowed pumps uh there are i know as you know with technology moving forward which is a good thing uh i believe the artificial pancreas is going to be available is it to over 12 i believe in march or the, is it the, maybe that June? first i guess that first version that um medtronic is uh, making medtronic yeah out a little bit and then it seems like there's Actually, more than a handful of companies are coming behind in 2018 with their yeah, versions. Yeah, there's a it's lot of really things coming. going in the future. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, take for instance, that I believe there's that we still they still do finger sticks. They're just allowing this year, I believe, to have Dexcom use 
But once again, that's kind of limited because they're also um, strapped with the uh, medical personnel. There's only so many medical people. And depending if the medical people know a lot about the Dexcom, it can be challenging to manage Dexcoms, manage pumps. And some people still do shots as well, but you know it's it's a lot of management. So yes, they oh, have. Oh, I see medical- what you're saying. You know, you know, it's funny as you as you said that it, it really made me think about when my daughter was looking into technology the first time, and they tried to direct you to one pump, and then yeah, you know, they gave you all these reasons why it had to be this pump, and then you realize afterwards that's the pump they know how to use, and yeah. so they, they 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 just are trying to limit their situation where they don't know what they're doing or, or it takes up too much of their time. So at one point you think, um, is it fair to say that pumps were limited at camps at one point because it just, it added things that people needed to know and, and more what you consider sort of effort keeping the pump going and maybe infusion sets had to be changed and things like that. Because I've heard people say like, oh, it should be, a you know, back in the day it was like everybody, well, you should know how to take care of your diabetes with needles. That was a big push back then, but you don't really hear people say that as much anymore. No, now people are pushing more pumps because it's better control and better management. And then integrated with Dexcom, there's a lot more in the future. I know that's more going towards the technology. Yeah, so, yeah. you can definitely make, obviously make smaller adjustments and, and more fine adjustments with an insulin yeah, pump. Yeah, you fine tune. I say, you, you know, not a lot of people would be willing to inject 0.2 units of insulin to try to move a blood well, I don't sugar. I don't even know from, if you can. Uh, right, I think try, it's like a half unit, right? right? <laughs> to try to move a blood sugar from like, you know, 120 to 100. Like, you, 100, you, know, yeah. you would just look yeah. at it and go, I guess 120 is what we got today. But yeah, with, and that's fine. Yeah, yeah. But with a pump, you might be like, oh, hey, here's a little I can more. tweak that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, right, right. So, but so that's really cool too, because I have heard people say that, oh, well, I don't want to go to a camp because. They're going to take my pump from me, but that doesn't happen. No, so they excellent. actually, they, they're very open with pumps. As I said, the Dexcoms, they're, we're, they're transitioning into having Figuring kids use out. them. Now, does your daughter, uh, does or your have daughter, them on. on. Does I'm your sorry, daughter, what? I was going to say, does your daughter have Dexcom? Okay. She did get a Dexcom. I think it's been about a year and a half, but we've actually never used it. Are you scared of it? And that? I think that's more because of me, not because of her. Okay. But, you know, um, we do manage very well. Our last A1C was actually 6.0. Wow. So, yeah. So, I, you know, it's one of those sometimes too much information. And also I know she sometimes gets a little anxious. So I don't know if it would actually be detrimental and cause her anxiety to constantly know she can know her blood sugar number at any moment in time versus, hey, mom, I feel low or hey, mom, this or hey, mom, that. So we kind of have a Zen-like approach and it, it works and we do okay. So, so I think that's amazing. I think you should definitely do absolutely whatever works for you. I would say this to you. I uh-huh. would bet you that all the things that you were concerned about, if you used it, that you would realize they weren't concerns. Okay. Like, like, and so I, I, I can recall having this thought about two years ago when you started seeing people like sort of helicopter parent over like the dad. Yeah, like, that's right, what I see a lot right? of. And You'll was, be up to lunch, and, and they're like looking at, oh, my daughter's rising. She's going down. And I'm just like, oh. <laughs> I think that might be maybe what you see in that setting is a little more of, um, I don't know. I don't want to malign the people you're with, but maybe they're just attention-seeking a little bit. I don't, think, okay. I don't think that it would really overwhelm you the way you think. I think that what would happen is that you might find out that your A1C is 6.0, but maybe you're accomplishing that through some lows you don't know are happening. No, I'm aware, yes. Right, no, and I then maybe that. you could like, you know, I don't know. I'm just, you should do whatever you want, obviously. Um, yeah. And it's probably incumbent upon me to tell you that the Dexcom actually sponsors this podcast. But that's not why I'm talking about it like that. I just think that I, what I've seen is that the the concerns that are very feel very legitimate, I've seen them, I've I've thought about them just like you have, they don't really exist. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like that idea, I, I remember feeling very strongly about what you were saying at one point and then seeing it sort of work itself out in the, in the community at some point to where I don't feel like it's like that anymore. But, mm-hmm. but, uh, to, first of all, you know, A1C is fantastic. Congratulations. Well, and, thank you. Uh, yeah. 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 And, um, and, and, and all of that, but I would just say that, huh, I don't know what I would say. I would say that last night I was talking to a person through text messages who, has been really working hard on pre-bolusing their four-year-old. Oh, and, um, okay. And she's getting it, but the, the the child's been getting just a little low at one point before the blood sugar comes back up again. And, oh. we, and we were talking about how to um, extend a little bit of the bolus at, and, and how to get that done. 
And everything she and I were talking about, we were able to talk about because of being able to see her, that trend The deck pump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's one of those conversations we were actually didn't have to have in the abstract because we could see the line. So mm-hmm. You could actually have it like a real conversation about not uh, we weren't guessing. And so mm-hmm. anyway, I don't know. You, please you do whatever you want. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, and yeah, I yeah, believe yeah. me, I do. Uh, you know, on Friday night, my daughter had gone to see Beauty and the Beast with a, a boy mm-hmm. that she has an interest in in one of the um, activities she does. This boy, though, actually didn't know she was a type one diabetic. OK, so we go to the theater and we're in line and, you know, we kind of have just and once, not that I'm a strict parent, because I do let her eat like a healthy child should eat, but you know, it's, I, I don't really want her to eat a whole bag of, you know, the three and a half servings of M&M when we go to the movie. <laughs> you feel like it's that might a be too much? <laughs> You're it saying if she, if that's she didn't have lot. diabetes, you wouldn't be down with her eating You it shouldn't time. be doing that. Right, yes. Right, that's, right, and right. that's even with my other two, because I have two other children. And you know, we all follow the same guidelines. They all eat like healthy children should eat. Mm-hmm. Definitely before she was diagnosed, let's say, I was a little more like, ah, whatever. Yeah. But now that, you know, we all try to eat the way we should really eat. Yeah, good. Absolutely. So um anyway, um, you know, this boy, he got the medium popcorn and then he wanted the sweet tart something gushers. <laughs> I- <laughs> so obviously I couldn't like he's not my child, so right. I can't say anything. And then she ended up getting the small popcorn, which is, that's okay. Right. And then she wanted the bag of M&M's. And I'm like, M, I'm like, you can have the popcorn. I'll let you have, you know, a, a, like an ounce, you know, we count them. I'll let you have, you know, whatever serving of M&M's I can find on the Calorie King app. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, that's, you know, sorry. That's just, <laughs> well, that's just the way it is. So, Lori, let me, let me share something with you because my daughter saw the um, Beauty and the Beast this weekend too. She went with a friend while my wife and I saw Logan in the same theater. Oh, right, right. okay. And so I'm going to give you a great example of, because you've just described exactly how I would have gone to the movies with my daughter prior to like monitoring, right? So, okay. so Arden's movie started 15 minutes before our movie. We all, you know, we took the kids to get their snacks yeah. Um, I think they got her and her girlfriend got a popcorn, a nacho, and some sort of candy that they were going to share. Okay. And um, we bolused her blood sugar was about one twenty five out in the That's lobby. Good. Yeah, right? within so, range. Yeah. So we gave her a bunch of insulin because this was going to be this is going to be a lot of carbs. And yeah. to be honest with you, I don't know how many. It's it's unimportant because what yeah. I can tell you is that when she goes to the theater and gets these similar things, I know it takes about uh, 10 units of insulin for her. So okay. I bolused her. I gave her eight units, and I did it as an extended. Like first, I doubled her basal for an hour and a half. Just did that blindly. And so mm-hmm. and then I and then I gave her eight eight, like eight units extended. I gave her five of the units up front. I told the other three to go in over an hour. Okay. And so she goes into the theater and she just got in there really quickly. So I said to her, Hey, is like, can you just get settled first? Like give the insulin a head start for me. And she was mm-hmm. like, okay. And so then I saw she was 140 diagonal up and I said, Hey, cancel the extended bolus. And, Do it now. And whatever insulin didn't go in, put it all in right now. And I want you yeah. to add another unit. So she sat in that movie. That's a long movie too. And uh-huh. she snacked on nachos and cheese and popcorn and a drink and some sort of candy. Like I said, I have literally no idea how much she ate, but I can tell you that her blood sugar did go to 170 and it was 106 by the time we left the theater. That was actually a very good, uh, in that, in, yeah. Yeah, and, and it was because every once in a while I could like sneak a look at my phone and send her a text and you say, you can see the data. Hey, yeah. Can you bowl us another unit? We should have gone one more unit. Or, yeah. by the way, maybe our bolus was right in the beginning, but maybe she's just continuing to snack and requires more and more insulin. Additional insulin, right? yeah. And so, but so if you can imagine that she saw Beauty and the Beast, had candy, popcorn, soda, nachos, and left the theater at 106, like that to that's me. That's good. That to yeah, me is. Kudos sort of, to you, no, yeah. No, 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 please, please, please. Not to me. To the te- that, that's to me, that's technology. A selling point of the technology. Yeah. 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 So, anyway. Well, Lori, would you believe that we have been speaking for 56 minutes already? Wow. Yeah, because you're good at this, by the way. You're natu- oh, thank you. You're naturally chatty, so that works out very well. Um, I, so, okay, so we kind of understand the pricing, and we understand the benefits of the camp. We understand why there's a J in the name, um, and, and yeah. we understand that it's in New Jersey. Where in New Jersey is it? 
in Stillwater, New Jersey. So it's, uh, I want to say North, I call it Northwest New Jersey. Uh, it's, oh, I'm, how long you know, from I'm Manhattan not, to I, to I, can I drive from Manhattan to there or from Philly or something like that? Oh yes, Very easily. Okay. So, I would say from Philly, maybe two, two and a half hours. And, uh, from Manhattan, maybe two hours. Okay. Right, so, Obviously, assuming traffic is decent, you know, nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, oh, that was the same thing you did with the girl not being pregnant. That was so nice. You're like, you know, I, I mean, I'm giving you two and a half hours, but that's if it's good traffic. And so <laughs> <laughs> you were totally somebody's mom, by the way. And so, uh, and so, you know, so you go, you, you shove the kid out of the car because they don't really want to talk to you anymore. Come back a week later. Is there a parent day or in the two, middle? Or depending, two, you know, how two, long they want to go. Two weeks, so. right. Is there a parent day? Do you ever show up or no? No. Okay. Um, and obviously they, they prefer you not to call uh, you. You're welcome to call every day, twice a day, as long as many times as you want to talk to the uh, medical staff. Cause if you're concerned about your child's diabetes, mm -hmm. but you know, in general, they try not to have parents converse with kids cause then that can lead to homesickness or it's that trickle down effect where your kid might not be homesick, but if the kid that's kind of on the brink of homesickness found out that their friend just talked to their mom, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but that's probably standard for that's sleep that's away that's camps. Yeah, yeah. camps. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, you don't want to freak out the kids. And so, yeah. and so, okay, so do they go to that? Where do they, where would people learn more? Is it a website or can I get yeah. it? Go ahead. Um, I should probably know that website. Oh, uh, listen, I got www.campnegetta, that's C-A-M-P, N as in Nancy, E-J as in Jersey, E D D. EDA.org. Okay. And I'm going to put links in with the show where people can just click okay. on them and go straight through. But um, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying. You're a proponent. And so if somebody's never done camp before, they should, you think it's, it's well worth trying one time. Yes. Yeah. And even if you're hesitant or, you know, you don't really, you're tentative yourself, not the child, your parent, let's say, um, you know, you can call them. You can, I'm sure you could take a tour of the camp. You can, you know, they'll gladly outreach, talk to you. Um, cool. it, as I, I've only had such a positive, great experience there and my daughter as well. And, you know, they also have uh, weekends, like they'll have BFF weekend. It's the first weekend in May um, where my daughter can actually bring a friend who's not a type one so that they can see, you know, what, what, what's all the hype she's talking about, how great Camp Nijetta is. And she has all this fun. Well, I want to come too. And so there's a weekend actually, for that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Is that a weekend? It's a specific weekend you said? Yes. It's May 5th through May 7th. Okay. I think it's a, it's a Friday. May 5th is a Friday. So you do not discriminate against kids whose pancreases do work, is what you're saying. We do not. Yeah, that's and nice. I, okay, so this uh, past September, my daughter turned 10. So I, uh, we did fundraising, and we raised enough that we actually were able to get a cabin. So this was kind of like her birthday present. So mm -hmm. she had six of her friends come with her to Camp Nijetta for the night before the walkathon because the walkathon is a very big fundraising event they do there. Okay. All of her friends the next day, they had reps from, uh, it, I think, Animus. They had the Omnipod rep. There might have even been Dexcom there. I don't, I don't recall exactly. But um, all of her friends had pods on that next day at the walkathon because they wanted to kind of be like Emily. The demo pods from Omnipod? Yes, demo pods, yeah. But it just, you know, it, it just makes, you know, it, and it kind of, it was it's a feel good feeling on all ends. Like here's my daughter who yes, does have a chronic disease. Here are her friends that love her that almost like, you know, it's cool to have this. Yeah. Like it, it's okay. I mean, they don't understand, you know, maintenance and yeah, right. what diabetes really <laughs> means and does, but you know, it's, it, it just, it, it was, it's no, just I great totally to get have what that kind mean. of support and love. Yeah. So. I totally get what you mean. I, I think that, that seeing, like seeing someone go that extra mile to try to understand your life a little better is, is, it's fantastic. It's, it's yeah. you know, it's very hard so. and, and excellent. All right, Lori, listen, you have done a great job. If someone oh, doesn't you. hear this, it's podcast, been wonderful chatting with you. So you're very much too kind and you're very too polite. You're so polite that even if it wasn't great chatting with me, you would have said that at the end. No, but, I really mean it. Nah, now, when you tell people about this later, tell them I was appropriately dressed while we were speaking, please. I, I don't know though. I can't see. <laughs> you're not going to take my word for that. <laughs> Now, you know, a lot of people listen to this and now they're wondering, he doesn't do that podcast naked, right? And it's absolutely not. I'm, they may think you do now. <laughs> well, I'm completely dressed and I have a sweatshirt on. I'm chilly. So um, I don't know what you have going for the rest of the day. You said you're a stay-at-home parent. I am also a stay-at-home parent. I am going to uh, clean my carpet 
and then mop the floor in the kitchen, do two loads of laundry, and change the sheets on my bed. My day is scintillatingly cool. exciting. Um, that is. And I, I, I want everyone to feel very, very, very jealous of, of what it is that I do when this podcast is over because obviously. okay well I'm a, I have a little envy there can you come to my house and help me no I need to <laughs> um, I have to clean my own carpet so that later my wife can tell me how there are other things I didn't do and um, and keep me on um, where I'm at you know not, oh, not okay. feeling too good about myself uh, <laughs> but but not being destitute that she likes to keep me right in that plane uh, I think that, oh, okay. that must be where I'm the most um, uh, compliant. I'm, I'm assuming. She keeps you cost- it's like the dog with the tree. You got to keep them going. <laughs> I don't know. She starts <laughs> seeing me smile and she's like, no, 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 no. And then, you know, then she takes care of it. So she's very good at it. Anyway, yeah. mostly. I'm so talking. it was nice chatting. So you're, you're, is it Avery or I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, Arden. Arden. Yeah. She's the type one. And do you have any other children or just her? Uh, our son Cole is 17. He doesn't have diabetes. Oh, okay. He and is he's irritating, older. but um, but there's no diabetes. <laughs> oh, okay. He's he is an emotional up and down, but that's just uh, hormones. No, he's just he's fine. He's just he's just he's in the house all the time, and he has he wants things, and he like fo- okay. food and. And now, how is he with respect to your daughter? Oh, he's he's fantastic. He's cool. I mean, he's a good I mean, brother. He was. My rough math would tell me that he was like seven when she was diagnosed. So it's been as much a part of his life as it has been hers, honestly. Mm-hmm. And, and and at the same time, I always feel a little weird about that question because he's not involved in her diabetes. You know, it's you know, but but if I were to text him and they were by themselves at home and I was at the grocery store in the afternoon, I would text him and say, "Hey, look, I've texted Arden three times. She's not answering me." And she needs a juice. Like you got to drop what you're doing and go find her for me. And he'll do that. That's yeah, yeah, thing. yeah. And it's not like later that he's wandering around, stomping his feet, saying, "I can't believe it. I have to do that." Yeah. yeah, it's nothing like yeah. that. I don't think that um, he feels put off. I think when he was younger, there was probably a couple of moments where you know where you're like, "Hey, we're gonna go to dinner," and then you go, "Oh, you know what? We're gonna go to dinner in 45 minutes because I gotta get Arden's blood sugar to come down first. Yeah, I yeah, I understand. Know that he was thrilled with that, but. It, I yeah. haven't seen any long-term effects of him. Uh, you know, he, they don't hate each other or anything like that. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, the yeah, one yeah, thing yeah. – well, Emily's my oldest, and um, she's a brother 18 months younger and then another sister two years younger than my son. And uh, the one thing – and this and this is actually a, a leeway to a, another podcast, possibly you could find somebody. Um, kind of the, the sibling aspect of – I want to say that my younger ones are jealous, but, you know, sometimes I do think – they think I spend more time with Emily because, you know, I might be bulleting her counting this or doing that. Right. And I want to say that whole, the fairness thing. That's always the, that's not fair. Yeah. Yeah. Why does Emily get that? And so, you know, I would say that diabetes or no diabetes, those are the moments where I just tell them to shut up. I mean, I know that parenting magazine doesn't say that's appropriate, but I will look at my son and be like, just stop. And yeah. 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 I mean, he's going to have some sort of a psychological scar from me raising him. So it might as well make my life easier, is what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wasn't going to do a perfect job. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, we always all try our best. Yeah. But also, he's older and mine are younger. So it's, I guess it's also birth order. You know, there's a lot of Oh, no, of course. Yeah, if they're younger, then they're going to see, they're going to see, you know, joking aside, they're going to see you spending more time with her. They're not going to be, you know, it's not like, the, you know, it's not like a five-year-old would be like, well, yeah, mom's spending more time with her, but my pancreas works, so I'm going to shut my mouth now. Like it's, you know, it's not, yeah. it's just, it's just the basic thing. But I think that it, most of that struggle, if it is a struggle, is you being cognizant of it, honestly, because mm-hmm. then you can, yeah. you can work it out and talk with them and make a mm-hmm. concerted effort to spend a couple extra minutes for other stuff. You know, isn't yeah. it funny the way you balance that out is you, have, you're going to have to exclude your other daughter from things to do with them. <laughs> say, <laughs> say, look, see how I'm ignoring her now. Mommy loves you too. <laughs> They only knew what we did, or what she, if she only knew what we did when she was at camp, right? <laughs> oh, I, I'm sure they'll, they'll, it probably turns into like that thousand dollars. You're probably like, here you go, kid. Here's a couple bucks. Let's get you up to camp now. We're going to Cabo. And so, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> you know, there are parents that do that. Now, I'm not one of them. Boogie but... in the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> No, because once again, it's that safety where you know your child is safe. And that's the other thing, too, that we didn't even touch upon. But right. No, I would say, joking, joking aside, that's a huge thing, right? Like your, your kid is somewhere where you can be uh, 
comfortable that their you know, health is safe. being taken You don't have to worry about them. Right. And so you, you can know, shut your diabetes we... switch off, right? And go somewhere. Yeah. Right. It's almost like a vacation for the parents and the family because you don't have to worry about that anymore for that week or that two weeks. I'm going to tell you, I and wasn't you know, thinking about camp, but as, now I am. <laughs> as uh, much as um, my school nurse, I mean, she, she's good, but she doesn't necessarily understand the whole breadth of the disease mm-hmm. as to where she's just checking Emily at lunch or Emily checks herself basically and bolus herself, but she has to go to the nurse's office because that's the protocol that, you know, the endocrinologists recommend until they're in high school. Um, and some of the, yeah, I don't, whatever she means. Well, as I said, my daughter's not going to die at school. <laughs> that, so, yeah, so, but you're still thinking about it. She's maybe not managing type one the way you would do it if you were with yeah. her. Right. But you know what? I know she's going to be okay. Nothing bad's going to happen. Um, but, um, when I, when she's at camp, I really don't have to worry at all. I, I literally, I can shut that switch off for that week or two weeks and be like, she's okay. I can take a breath and be like, you know, I really, and, and sometimes when she's, I mean, she hasn't gone that many years, but there were moments even last year, she went three weeks last year and I woke up in the middle of the night and I'm like, Oh my God, I forgot she's Emily's pump. And I'm like, wait a minute, she's not here. <laughs> I have to go back to sleep immediately before I, I wake up. go back up. to sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what too is, it's, you know, then, then it, you know, I, I'm hearing when you're talking, I'm thinking, well, then one of the great benefits of this is there's a normalcy then for her, because now all of a sudden you don't have to think of her as being a kid with diabetes. You can just, you can worry about the regular things like, oh, I hope a canoe doesn't hit her in the head. Like, yeah, you know, right. Yeah, and, and, or what's going to happen. Yeah. 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 But <laughs> seriously, like, uh, you know, then you can think of her more because that's a struggle I had for a number of years where I would look at Arden and when she'd walk into a room and I would see her diabetes before I would see her. Yes. Or that would be the first, fourth run on your mind. And that took me a while when Emily was even first diagnosed, I would be like, all right, what was what was your BG at lunch or what was this or what was that? I don't ask her that anymore. Or at least I really try not to. I'll always ask, Oh, how was lunch today? Who'd you, what'd you do at recess? Yeah. No, no, no. Middle, I, was I, your BG in range today? There's a ton of value in that. There really is. And I will say, I was going to share this with you too, cause you haven't listened to the podcast that much, but, um, my daughter hasn't been to the nurse's office since the last day of second grade and she's in seventh now. So wow. we, we do everything on the back of, she has a pump. So there's just, you know, she has an Omnipod. Yeah. She's pushing yeah. The buttons. She's a Dexcom, so I can see her blood sugar. And um, oh, yeah. her phone is part of her 504 plan, so she we just text freely back and forth. Oh, and so that she, is great. Yeah, so she and I manage like that, and it saves her the time from having to go to the nurse. You know, office. actually, in hindsight, I think I might have read your blog like a year or two ago. It's a fantastic blog. You probably did. Go ahead and pimp it. No, right no, no. I, I, now it's all starting to come back to me because I do recall reading – I don't remember where I was, but there was – that kind of scenario going on. Yeah. And actually, I think that's great. And I, I wish I, yeah, I, I don't know when, well, you're, you know, are you in Jersey? About your endocrinologist, but, um, our endocrinology department is very, cause I even had said next year she's in middle school and they're like, no, no, the protocol is that, you know, they have to go to the nurse. And then when they're in high school, they, you know, and I'm like, but it doesn't happen overnight. They already know what they're doing. So, so here you go. Let me, let me give you, this is my one piece of unsolicited advice I'm going to give you. Yeah. You gave us a lot of good advice about camp. So, um, oh, hold on a second. I've been texting Arden the whole time and she's been ignored. Oh, okay. And now I finally got a hold of her. Um, and so here's my one piece of, of advice. Just tell them, uh, like I do with my son, shut up. And uh, we're not listening to you and stop. And we're going to, this is how we're going to do it now. And you don't need to like it, but I hope you get on board because you're a, a, an important part of my daughter's health care. But uh-huh. this is what we're doing now. You, you, you can do that. If you're, yeah. comf- if you're comfortable and you oh, think, yeah. well, then tell and them ironically, no. too, uh, I think it was last, I want to say maybe it was in the fall visit or maybe it was like the, a visit a year ago. Yeah. My daughter, sometimes she wants a cookie after she eats her lunch. For her to go back to the nurse, tell the nurse how many carbs it is. The nurse not to screw up and count her blood sugar again so that wouldn't give her the right bolus. Because I, I don't know if you know what the I, your pump and the IOB and all that stuff, how it calculates things. Sure. So I just say, M, just have the cookie, bolus yourself. She told the dietitian this, that she does this. I got, I then saw the nurse, you know, it was her annual visit with the dietitian and the, the nurse. Yeah. And the nurse was like, um, you know, you... She can't be doing that. I'm like, what do you mean she can't do that? She knows how to do it better than the nurse would know how to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you you should have been in the 504 meeting when my daughter – so my daughter stopped going to the nurse in second grade. So third grade, fourth grade, 
fifth okay, grade, wow. et cetera, right? She's never been to the nurse. And then she moved to the middle school. And when she moved to the middle school, that nurse was like, oh, no, that's not how we do it here. And I went, oh, well, that's how we do it. So that's it. Thank you. Bad. Yeah. Thanks for your insight. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then she, and trust me, she was, she felt the same way. I heard what you just said is what I heard from her, but this is the protocol. This is how we do it. I need to know what's happening, blah, blah, blah. And then finally I just said to her, I'm like, look, you don't understand. I was like, she and I are, are we're in contact, right? So I said, if something yeah. bad happens, it's my fault. It's not your fault. First of all, yeah. you, you don't need to know anything. And she's like, no, no. I do. And, and I said, I, so I said, I'm sorry, Larry. I said to her, do you know what Arden does when she leaves and comes home or what we do in the middle of the night or on Saturday? You don't know any of that. You know and, nothing. Yeah. 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 And she's yeah. still alive. And you, and so you really don't need, you want to know this is how you've done it in the past. All that I completely understand. You should give this a try and you'll see. And I just spoke to her the other day because Arden's on the softball team at school. And she's like, hey, I had to give my glucagon to the softball coach. Could you bring another one in? And I was like, yeah, whatever. We don't use them, so you can have it. And yeah. um, and so uh, I was like, yeah. And I realized when I was talking to her, I genuinely don't know the last time I've spoken to this person. She, uh -huh. we're, we're literally strangers. We do not know each other. And everything is fine. Yeah. And so it's No, just, that's great. Because yeah. I actually seem to think, especially as they get older – they're actually better than trying to explain it to the nurse when you have to reiterate because they don't see the whole picture. And, and that's, I don't want to say they don't get it, but yep. they, it's go, just different. Lori, I'm going to tell you, go back into early in the podcast and read or, and listen to an episode called Texting Diabetes. It's where I kind of explain how Arn and I handle all You do it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's where it's it, because you're – here's what I'm hearing with you. You're uh -huh. there. You want to do it. Oh, I do. Right. And you're – and so, so many people – fall into this exact spice that you're in right now. It's just such a common thing, right? Where it's, it's I, I know what I'm seeing isn't right, or it could be different, it could be better, but I'm allowing these perceived rules to stop me. And I think you should mm -hmm. do whatever you want. So that's yeah, all no, I'm Well, thank it. you for yeah. your insight and help or input. Uh, as I said, I've, I've been very frustrated at times with certain things. And uh, anyway. Laura, you want my best advice that, uh -huh. I, that I will call advice? Trust your gut. Mm -hmm. Do what you think's right. I, I I genuinely think that everybody living with diabetes would be better off if they trusted themselves a little more. Yeah. And so you see what you, you, you when you see something that doesn't make sense to you, you got to trust yourself and push pack push past the limits that other people have set up for you. That's me, and I'm getting a little weird now. But just keep this in mind, Lori. Yeah, I've done, no, I've done I, all I this will. completely dressed appropriately. That's the important part. I, mm -hmm. I'm clothed, and um, and that really is the important. Part. <laughs> <laughs> well, have a wonderful day, Scott, Very and enjoy your, uh, your, your, your task. Carpet cleaning. Thank you. <laughs> have a great day. All right. Bye-bye. Learn more about Camp Najeda at campnajeda.org. C-A-M-P-N-E-J-E-D-A.org. Org is O-R-G. This episode is going live at the end of April or May 2017. You can begin to sign up now for summer. Thank you so much to our sponsors, Omnipod and Dexcom. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for sponsoring the Juicebox podcast. Go to myomnipod.com forward slash juicebox or dexcom.com forward slash juicebox to support the podcast and to find out more. As I said in the beginning, if you're enjoying the podcast, please tell a friend. Show them how to download the podcast. Not everybody understands podcasts like you do. If they seem super confused, just send them to juiceboxpodcast.com. Then from there, they can listen right online or figure it out with like little clickies. Clickies are sometimes easier for people to handle. Lastly, I've been thinking about making a t-shirt for the podcast. Maybe something that says bold with insulin on it. Um, find me on the Insta, uh, Instagram, -y, uh, Twitter, Facebook places, and let me know if you think that's a good idea. I'm really going to gauge whether I do this or not by whether or not I hear back from people.